and um, uh, really thankful to have this opportunity to show here and, and to talk to you guys about uh, my process. Uh, the idea uh, behind these talks, I think, is to talk more, more about process um, and about uh, professional development strategies and that kind of thing, less about the artwork itself. Um, so what I thought I'd do tonight is I'm going to uh, just blow through a, a giant pile of images. Um, this is like a, a 45 minute artist talk that I put together. Um, we're going to do it in about 10 or 15. Um, but feel free to jump in anytime, particularly with a small group, anytime you have any questions, anytime you want to kind of go off on a tangent, if anything brings anything to mind, um, by all means, just shout it out. Um, uh, we can uh, steer this towards your particular areas of interest. No problem. Yes? Before we go there, I just wanted to mention we have one last lecture uh, next Monday, which is going to be on marketing for working artists. So if you have questions about that, you can come and learn a little bit and ask some more questions. Um, that's by our very own Cynthia Spencer, who is the executive director here. Um, and then we also have our annual Howland Open coming up. So anybody from the community can submit artwork and we will put it on the walls. And it's super fun. There's tons of artwork. Um, so if you are interested, you can grab one of these. Um, I think that's all of the events that we have coming up. Um, oh, the lectures from 5.30 to 7 right here on Monday. Um, and then if you don't mind using the microphone, just because that microphone doesn't work great. So Got hopefully it. we can all hear you. Is that working? Is that better? No, it's not on. There How we go. That? Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, so my name is Pete Goldless. Uh, let's see, how are we going to control the, the images? Uh, do I have a uh, There you go. And you're just going to use that button right there. Okay. Um, yes, so, uh, so I'm going to go back into ancient history. Project that I did coming out of art school. Uh, when I went into art school, I was uh, planning to study advertising design. Um, that's how I chose my art school. Um, that's all I knew about art pretty much as a, as a kid. My parents were not artists. Um, we went to museums, I took art lessons, they were very encouraging, but I had no concept of being a professional artist coming out of school. So uh, once I got to the great wide world of art school where they had 20 different majors, um, I gradually worked my way around to, to illustration and then um, to painting. And by the time I was done, got a completely uh, uh, worthless fine art degree um, and was kind of set on the road. So um, coming out of art school, I learned uh, from studying illustration, did a lot of work with um, a, a, a technique that one of my teachers used was um, it, uh, the, the uh, technique that they used to do animation cell painting, the old, uh, old school cell paintings like Disney, all the Disney films, um, reverse painting on a sheet of acetate with technical pens and acrylics. acrylics. Um, so this is the piece that's back there. This was um, uh, my way of figuring out what to do after art school. So um, I decided I was gonna get the biggest sheet of acetate I could find and I was just gonna work on it until it was done. So that was my next four years. Um, it was a good strategy to prevent any commercial uh, influence from entering the work at all because it was a completely unshowable, unsellable piece of work, but it, it got me into the headspace of, of doing art um, and didn't have to, it, it helped me avoid those kind of uncomfortable times in between when you don't really have your direction and you have to, have to you finish a piece and then you have to think of something else. This was just a stream consciousness process. Um, so that piece, I, now for, for the first time. I got it. Uh, I had a chance to show that. So this is a, a scroll painting, it's about 30 feet long, and it's in that uh, case back there. Um, you can see a section of it a day as they move it along. Um, okay. 
So, um, so after I was out of school, I took about seven years off. Uh, then I went back to school uh, for a graduate degree at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, intended to, to work with a group of uh, artists that did similar work to the, that piece. Um, got completely psyched out from being in grad school, um, decided I needed to try something completely new. Um, started exploring the, uh, just starting from, from step one and uh, went into the, the kids section of the art store and uh, had a lot of uh, children's art supplies. Uh, started doing these uh, crayon carvings um, and also working with Sculpey, Palmer Clay. Um, so that's, that's this work, started doing uh, work with, with that material. It's a, generally a, a kid's uh, material and people use it for craft and I really feel like it's a totally underused uh, material. It's kind of where acrylic paint was 30 or 40 years ago where people don't really even consider it paint, but now it's everywhere. And, um, so it's a, a really nice kind of fluid medium with, with very little grain. It's almost like working with molten glass. So I, I think everybody should work with polymer clay. Um, so I started doing these um, installations of these, you know, these are tiny pieces. It's, they have to be small enough to work in a, a, a toaster oven. Um, that's how you bake them and make them solid. Uh, but then I was doing these larger installations with the pieces and starting to play with um, painting shadows on the walls behind them, uh, having the real shadows play with the, the fake shadows, um, starting to work with wood, knowing nothing about woodworking. Found objects. Uh, this was a, a, a um, kind of a breakthrough for me working with a partner. Um, I got connected with another artist who did these amazing um, kind of grotesque, uh, enchanted uh, animal plant forms and um, she made these great jungles and uh, I would infest them with my little uh, Palmer clay sculptures. Um, so that was uh, kind of got me started on work, seeing a, a lot of value in working with collaborators, and I still, um, that's made a huge difference in, in the other directions that I've gone since then. So we moved, we've been in Los Angeles and then moved to um, a little artist community in Arizona, so it was kind of uh, pastel -y desert colors started seeping into the work. Uh, this piece, uh, this was a collection of uh, uh, about 60 small sculptures. This was really one of my first uh, public art commissions. A uh, library in the Bay Area bought this collection. Um, it's really super exciting for me until um, I saw the space. Um, it was basically uh, a space that was separated from uh, pedestrian traffic by like a 10 foot, 20 foot chasm. So um, these are completely invisible to humanity at this point, that, but they're, they're up there, they're hanging on a wall in public. Um, I think they made a very bad choice in uh, selecting artwork for that space, but um, it was exciting for me. <laughs> um, so this is um, one, one of the, um, the public art opportunities I had in Arizona. Um, uh, this was a program that runs through several of the, the smaller cities around Phoenix where they connect artists with, um, uh, with open storefront uh, property and people will do temporary uh, installations in these storefronts um, it's a, and uh, gives people an opportunity to kind of dip their toe into public art, work a little bit larger, um, but not yet have to build things to withstand the weather. Um, so 
Um, so that was a really good kind of gateway project. And there are some of those programs around here in the Northwest as well, and I can talk more about those. Those might be of real interest to you if you're looking to, to get into public order. And these are just, um, you know, again, really basic materials, um, paint pens and acrylics, um, windows and uh, polymer clay sculptures uh, suspended behind them, making a kind of big diorama. Uh, this is another, this is one of those programs. This is a little out of order, but this is another temporary uh, project for a, a similar program in uh, Auburn, Washington which is a good one to keep in mind. Um, generally, they pay a little bit of money too, so that, you, know, you don't make a lot off it, but it, if you're lucky, it'll cover your expenses and give you, um, you know, a chance to build your portfolio in public art. So again, these are just um, paintings on, uh, on cardboard and mounted. And these are mounted a little bit off the wall. Um, as I, you know, earlier I talked about the shadows, and that's something I've tried to develop a lot to give some dimension to this really flat graphic work that I do, make them a little bit more sculptural. Um, this is the piece that, um, that you see on the wall over there. Uh, this is a mural for a, a, the same program uh, in a different city in Arizona, uh, transportation center. Uh, where they wanted to emphasize uh, uh, green transporta transportation options. And then so it's, a, it, you know, it's playing with um, uh, these kind of surrealistic uh, Victorian roller skates and, and over elaborate bicycles and things. Another one of the, these projects, um, in the outside gallery space. And I started working in soft sculpture. Uh, again, uh, sewing is another area I know nothing about, um, but it was just kind of a question of wanting to make these things bigger um, and um, just picking up a needle and starting to do some things. And obviously these kind of uh, jellyfish-like um, mollusk forms that I tend to work with are very forgiving of um, poor sewing skills. So I'm a big believer in working with what you got. Um, so these are um, all thrift store clothing, um, so it's all recycled stuff. I always recommend if you do um, uh, any public work, you should get pictures of um, kids abusing it because it always looks better with kids abusing it. <laughs> Another one, this is a, um, a slightly larger public art commission um, where we uh, had a, a semi, it was a sheltered outdoor space and this is working with a, a, a different partner um, to do this. This is all, the, again, used recycled jeans and fabric. Um, and this was a project um, based on, on that work. Um, we sort of made a cold call to uh, the, the Children's Museum of Phoenix um, and uh, pitched them doing a, an artist environment. Um, uh, uh, that was the most productive cold call I've ever made in my life. Um, turned out the woman I was talking to had hired me as a teacher a few years earlier and we had a connection and she was willing to listen to me and hear me out and um, and they were a grant and they did it. Um, so that's a, another strategy as far as um, making opportunities for yourself. That one, um, if I had had to compete with other more experienced artists in, in getting that, that opportunity, I probably would have been out of luck. Um, I didn't necessarily have the portfolio to do it. Um, uh, it was really based on the, the relationship that I had there um, and um, telling a good story, drawing cartoons of what we wanted to do. Um, and uh, by not, by finding a venue that we wanted to work, rather than uh, 
follow up answering a call to artists. Um, we kind of made an end run around that whole process, which really um, uh, turned out to be a good move. Um, That, sorry, that was a show? Uh, yeah, so that's this this exhibit. So it's a, a semi-permanent exhibit. It's still up there. It's been a few years now. Um, uh, yeah, so we, uh, we made these columns out of um, uh, tires and whatnot. I've been to that. That's, that's oh, you have? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Uh -huh. Oh, OK. It's awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, uh, yeah, I, I learned an awful lot through that process, but the partner that I applied with, um, she had more uh, public art experience than I did. I'll talk more about partner, partnering up. Um, but So her credibility helped us a lot. Uh, and then she quickly got too busy and had to back out of the project. So um, I was kind of in over my head and, and probably committed myself to way more than I should have and um, had no idea how to manage the budget. Um, but it's, you know, it was a chance to do something and to get some images from my portfolio to kind of build on to do the next thing. So it was a, a really great experience. This was a, a puppet theater that we um, ended up working with. A, you know, we had this idea to do these dismembered uh, stuffed animal parts and um, put Velcro on them and uh, make a puppet form uh, that the kids could uh, add Velcro and the kids would Velcro the features on um, to make their own characters. Uh, so this was a, a lesson in hiring out when we needed someone to to make something that was going to withstand actual handling, um, someone that you know knew how to how to sew structures, um, and so starting to to hire people out that had the the skills that I didn't have, um, which is always a really good thing to to keep in mind as you're getting into the public art. You, um, don't let your I, I'm a big believer that you can't let your your lack of um, technical ability get in your way if you have ideas for things. Um, finding people that have these technical skills really isn't that hard. Um, if you're willing to pay someone, they'll be happy to teach you. Um, uh, you're, you know, you're making another opportunity for another another artist or craftsperson, and it, it works out well for everybody. And, um, that that was really fun. And again, these uh, the word walls in the back. This is kind of a, a giant. Uh, uh, magnetic poetry thing that we did out of uh, recycled clothing, uh, Velcro on the backs, so, so they stuck to the Velcro walls, and kids can make these, um, you know, make their own stories on the walls. Uh, again, that was, I would cut out the letters, uh, you know, choose the fabrics, cut out the letters, um, kind of figure out the colors that gonna, and the fabrics that were going to go into it, and then I would hand them off to someone who was an actual seamstress person. Um, and she would make them built to last. Um, so um, that worked out well. Uh, this is getting into um, the, the pieces that are over there, doing these uh, poly jelly pieces. This is for a, um, a pediatric clinic in Arizona. Again, from spending too much time in the thrift stores. Um, this is working with that partner again. Uh, we got a commission to do uh, this furniture for a stop in Tucson uh, for the, the modern streetcar line that they're doing. Um, uh, my partner did the, uh, uh, the mosaic work that's on, on the ground, uh, and uh, I did the metal work and worked with the, the company that was already doing the cut patterns in the, the furniture at the stops. Um, so there was already a company that was involved there. Um, so rather than having them do the, the normal grid pattern that they would do in, in these chairs, um, we just were able to give them a different file um, and have them cut out our designs. So we really didn't have to pay for the, 
um, for their services. It, it worked out really well, and that, that again, these are tricks that a lot of them that I learned from the partner that I was working with um, to make the budget go further. And, and really, so, um, you know, the only skills that I needed, I needed some computer skills, and I needed, you know, to be able to do the drawings and figure out how to, how to design things that could be cut out and still uh, hold together. Um, but not a whole lot of technical knowledge. I didn't have to have a metal studio. Um, um, and that, that's also worked really well for me is working with fabricators uh, that know how to do things that I have no concept of. Um, and that's a large jet cutting, which I can talk more about if you're, if you're interested in doing graphic work that way. This is a close up. And doing some more things. So this was um, uh, for uh, my mother-in-law. She uh, took advantage of my newfound understanding of water jet cutting and commissioned me to do um, uh, a, a, you know, a piece for her house in exchange for her, um, a cheap used car. Um, so, but again, it's a piece that's still in my portfolio, um, and it's a way of kind of shimming your way up to um, uh, uh, to, to more involved public public pieces. Um, uh, this is using the same technique as water jet. Um, or actually, these were laser jet panels. Um, again, working with a fabricator. This is for a school in Washington D.C. Uh, that uh, we just did. And again, this is a drawing that was just done in, in pen and ink, uh, and I'm scanned in and manipulated on the computer. Um, so it's, it's been really exciting um, to see things that I'm just looking at on screen and on paper and then turn into an actual physical thing. It's kind of magic. And this was another project that I did with that partner. Um, she had this great idea to, um, to do these uh, one-off molds. Uh, they were looking for an artist to do, uh, a lot of times you see these repeated patterns in the sides of, of concrete work that, you know, on highways and things. And um, they'll have artists do um, a design and make a rubber mold of it so that they repeat it as it goes across the, you know, some big expanse. Um, and um, my partner's idea was to, to carve these molds, just make them one-off molds, um, carve them out of um, foam insulation with a, a hot knife. Um, so we were able to make these inexpensive molds and make enough of them that we could do a non-repeating pattern across like 300 feet of wall. And they would just insert these, these molds into the, uh, into the forms when they were pouring the, uh, the concrete. Were they one time use? They were. They were. They were recycled after that. We had to uh, dig up a company in, in the middle of Colorado that would accept a, 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 a truckload of styrofoam. So I'm not particularly proud of that material, but um, the artwork will last longer than my Palmer clay pieces. And this is another recent project. This was doing a terrazzo piece and also some other related projects for a, a library in Glendale, Arizona. So working with the community, coming up with a theme. Um, and these are, this is a, an example of the um, it's like 15 or 20 page proposal that I put together. So I can just blow through this and show you kind of you know, I'm showing them the inspiration for these things, um, how my ideas kind of uh, are, are related to the actual history and culture of the place. Um, and um, it's probably a good point to, to talk about um, the fact that when I got into public art, I really expected it to be a very intrusive process. Um, I had to do a lot of decision-making by committee uh, I've been really pleasantly surprised that uh, there's been very little of that. Um, I have to say, I, when I was working with commercial galleries, um, I, it felt a lot more intrusive. Um, 
because you get all this kind of subtle pressure from the gallery owner and there's all kinds of weirdness between artists and gallery owners and personalities and, and um, strange motivations. And um, with public art, it seems to be very upfront. Um, people are, are in that business um, to, to get artwork out in public. They're very, you know, their motivations are are fantastic for working in that area. The administrators, and they've all been great to work with. Um, and generally, you know, I've been able to do these kind of fantastical imaginary creatures as long as I can tie them into um, some general ideas that are specific to the place. Um, so that's kind of been my strategy um, as I've been in public art. So these are the initial sketches that I did. So this was um, a lot of times the way the the, pros, pro, the process works is there'll there'll be a call for qualification. So you send your your images, your statement, and your um, resume in, um, and then if you're lucky, you get named a finalist, and they will ask you for a proposal. And at that point, then you're competing against a much smaller number of people. Um, this one was just a one-step process. So um, they. Uh, selected me as a finalist just based on, on the previous work um, and an interview um, where I just talked very generally, didn't even have a concept for them, and that's that's how I made it through that process. Um, and then after I started on it, then I had to present my proposal to the community and to the city council, and so that's what you're looking at here. So a lot of those skills that you have to present you got kind of from the illustration and had it exactly kind of copy. Absolutely. Kind of strong. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and I have to confess at this point, um, but, uh, my skills are not as good as my wife's skills. Um, so okay. she does a lot of the, the design uh, side of things and, and puts together these proposals. Um, uh, so again, we're we're partnering with someone that has skill has skills that we don't have. Okay. It's it's really helpful. Um, and, you know, so for instance, I was just telling Hester, we, we just got done with a finalist proposal last night. Um, my wife pulled an all-nighter to pull together the proposal, um, and I got up in the morning and did the interview, and Melanie really feels like she got away with something because she didn't have to talk to anybody, and she didn't have to do the interview, and she didn't have to get on the phone and do the song and dance, and I was just happy, that, you know. I got to sleep last night, so, um, so you know, if you can find those areas where your, your skills um, complement someone else's, uh, it's, it's really a, a good way to kind of bootstrap yourself up to, into areas that you're not, you don't have experience in. Uh, this was some metal work based on some of the same, uh, the same imagery for that library, uh, again, a, a water jet cut project, stainless steel mounted against a uh, weathered Corten steel. And glass work. So again, the, the running theme in all these materials are their materials that I have never touched in my life, um, working with companies that, that can produce these things and counting on them to give me an education of what, what they need from me. Um, and, uh, you know, they generally have been really happy to do that because they're giving them business. So. And are they actually doing the installation then as yep. well? Yeah. And you're just kind of guiding them through or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and it's, been, it's been amazing. I mean, after you do the drawings and you kind of, I spent, you know, months kind of refining the, the cartoons and getting everything the way we need it, and um, then I get to stand back and, and you know, just see the, the photos they send me by email. Um, it's really exciting just to see these things turn into things. 
and all, all of these processes, the etched glass, the, the cut metal, the terrazzo, are, are, are all techniques that you can do um, working with specialists that, that know how to do them. Was there a question? The design of the, the windows. Um, this is uh, some designs for concrete work, and then this is to be um, sandblasted. It's working with a concrete company that will make a template and then sandblast the designs and into it. So you can see we line up it by definitely Or you kind of get to a point like your first fabricate working with fabricators, it was yeah. a harder process. Yeah, I, you know, it really varies depending on, on who you're working with. Um, sometimes they're, you know, if it's really a, a great company that's interested in working with artists, that's what you really want. Someone that, that wants a, the challenge of working, you know, with some new imagery and doing something that they don't always do. Because a lot of these companies will do, you know, the sandblasting company will do sandblasting to, you know, to clean off machinery. Um, and if you're, if you're lucky, you find a company like this that, um, you know, says, thank God I don't have to clean off another tractor, like, and they're, you know, it's, it's fun for them. They're not making their, you know, most of their money on these kinds of projects, but they're interested in keeping their, you know, their, their employees happy and doing something a little challenging and um, working with someone that knows nothing. And, um, it, and they kind of work through it. And, and you find that a lot of the skills that you learn in one technique really carry over, um, like the concrete work, um, the way that as it happens, the way that they do that is um, they create a water jet cut uh, sheet of metal, just like the, the metal work. So, you know, the skills I learned about putting, you know, designing for water jet cut metal then go into play in the, the concrete work. Um, and um, so a lot of the, a, a lot of the, the trick of getting into public art has so much to do, not with, not with the, the creative side of things, but being able to stomach the, the administrative side um, and willing to kind of pick up the phone and ask stupid questions to people and figure out who's willing to take your call, who's willing to work with you, who's you know, receptive and, and, and kind of do all that behind the scenes. I, I spend an awful lot of time doing that kind of work. Um, and you know, if, if, you're, if you're able to, to kind of get comfortable with um, uh, there it is. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Whether you're, if you're a person um, that kind of enjoys that social side of things, for for me, I, you know, I kind of I like to be all alone in my studio and just kind of do my stuff. But I also have a certain side of me that I, you know I enjoy talking to people on the phone and making those connections, and um, and I find that fulfilling. I didn't necessarily know that ahead of time, um, but it's something I kind of learned um, that I'm, I'm comfortable more or less doing that. Um, uh, and it, it's really helped. Um, you know, my wife, for instance, um, would, would go through any lengths she possibly can to avoid having a conversation with someone on the phone. Um, so she's, you know, she's very happy to throw me out there to do it. And um, if you're, if you're you know, willing to sound stupid, it, it, it will take you far. <laughs> um, so this is the and this is the cut metal that they did for the terrazzo. So that process again is water jet cut metal. So they're making the line work, and then what they do is um, I show some colors, and they so they fill in each of those areas. It's like a paint by number process with different color concrete mixes. Um, and uh, then they go back over it and grind it down and polish it smooth like you see in an airport. How, how did you know that this was possible in this particular technique? Because um, you did have to know that before you decide. Right. 
Um, I, a lot of these things I knew, again, from partnering up with, with my, my partner, Mary, um, who had been doing this before and knew what terrazzo was. And it's, you know, really when you explain it to someone, it's a pretty easy thing to wrap your head around. But in art school, I had no idea that these processes existed. Um, they weren't even touched on. You know, I spent seven long years in art school. Nobody mentioned terrazzo to me. Um, but it's actually, um, if you happen to, as we talk about finding opportunities, and if you see opportunities for terrazzo, if you're a painter or a, a 2D artist of any kind, I recommend thinking about terrazzo because, um, it, again, you don't have to know much about it in order to get into it. There's companies that specialize in producing this stuff, um, and they have a lot of money to be made. Um, by helping you along. And uh, so public art programs will often open up their terrazzo projects, like for airports and things, to people with no public art experience. Um, they'll, they'll specifically say that, like you don't have to know anything about public art to do this. Um, so it's a, another good gateway material to work in. I mean, you'll notice, you know, and, and none of my work involves carving marble. Um, it, it just, I do things that don't involve that level of hands-on skill, um, maybe someday, but I'm not there yet. Um, and, you know, so again, it's just word of mouth learning that Terrazzo existed. I had no idea how those floors get there in the airport. Um, and they seem to be doing more and more because I think the public art um, administrators and these programs, they're, it's really in their interest to get you as an artist to move into that area. Um, as, as hard as I work to get these opportunities, I have to say that it's really kind of an underpopulated area of the art world. Um, and I, I think that the administrative side keeps a lot of people out, the, the kind of just being willing to, you know, to make phone calls and send emails and polish your statement and get all your images together and all that stuff, if you're willing to do that, you're really ahead of the game because so many artists will just like go and you know want nothing to do with that and um it keeps a lot of people out of public art that would otherwise do amazing public artwork um and i you know between you and me you see a lot of really mediocre public artwork out there that uh, has a, a lot of money has gone into these things and my, my personal um thoughts about that is that it's it's the the factors that weed people out and and you know siphon people towards public art uh, are really unrelated to their abilities as an artist um, it's it's it, it's it's um, selecting for people that are have the administrative skills um, so if you're if you're willing to, to do that and and jump into that side of things there's there's really a spot to be made and and um, so these, uh, like some of the opportunities I showed earlier, um, like these storefront projects and the terrazzo, um, these are, the, the, it, once you start looking for these opportunities, you'll start seeing a lot of these that are really designed to funnel people from the fine art world into public art because they just have a shortage, um, which is kind of heartening to me because there's, you know, so many, very few areas of the art world, I think, that they're, you know, trying to recruit. How do you deal with the, uh, so the financing side of it, from the perspective you said that you uh, work with different metal workers and that kind of stuff, are you, are you taking that out of the grant money or, and do you then have to know ahead of time before you go and apply for this grant what that's gonna cost you for a certain time and that kind of yeah, um, and, and um, I, that's been a real education for me, really, uh, over the last year, um, which is the, uh, the first year that I've been doing this full time, um, and learning that process. Once you get selected as a finalist, um, again, we, we were just talking about this, uh, that you um, very often, you know, you, you put out your qualifications, um, you forget about it, and then two months later you get a call and you're a finalist, and they say in three or four weeks, you have to present your idea, um, which is not a way of working that I was ever familiar with. Um, and never, I work slow, I mean, point, point in, case in point. Um, uh, that was my natural mode, is to work on something for four years and never complete it. Um, 
So, um, I, you know, I've learned over the last year to develop that skill of um, being able to work on, on that kind of deadline and come up with an idea and also in that time um, go out, contact a fabricator, get them working on it, give you a quote of what it's going to cost, have them kind of talk you through it. Um, I mean, so you really have to have your concept done within a week or two so then you can go out and get help and get them help you figure out what the costs are going to be that are involved. Um, yeah. Um, specifically about that budget question, I've been on panels, so that's why I can answer this. If you are one of the selected people, you, you uh, give them this new specific design, and um, you would always have to include a budget. And these committees will look at how realistic they think your budget is. Do you pay yourself? Do you pay your fabricators enough? Do you have money for insurance? Because you have to be insured for a ridiculous amount of money. Um, so I think your, your uh, mode of working with similar techniques also give you a better insight of what is this going to cost. The three weeks is very short. I would say that quite it's often. It's not always that short, but you, you yeah, have, a month, a month and a half. Has right, been but, pretty but you have to have yeah. some pre-knowledge of what things ballpark could cost. Because uh, uh, I, I have a, a different question, is how do you determine which call to artist you will respond to? Um, it's really kind of been a question of, of digging through a lot of them and kind of parsing out, figuring out what, what things I'm looking for particularly. Um, I mean, you'll notice there's certain things that carry through my work, you, you know, imaginary creatures, um, uh, kind of semi-abstract cartooning. Um, uh, and I've gotten to the point, by the time I started doing public art, I kind of knew these are areas that I like to do. These are, um, you know, I know that if someone's looking for a bronze statuary, this realistic bronze statue, they're, they're not looking for me. Um, so I'm always looking for a way that I can connect with, with what they're doing. And I, so I'll, I'll kind of look for things that usually if they're looking for something science-based, I know they're not looking for me. They're not looking for something fun and playful and light. Um, they're looking for something that's more you know, conceptually rigorous and intellectually challenging and not necessarily for kids and, and you know, all these things that are not really what I'm about. Um, so I just, you know, pass up on those and I still find a lot of, of calls that kind of fit my personal criteria and that's, that's just something for, you know, for you to think about what, what would be your criteria and, and it will help looking, if you start looking at these calls and seeing what they're asking for, you'll, you'll start seeing patterns of things that that sounds enticing, that sounds not me, and, and then you know you, you kind of get a mental list of, of these things. Yep. And geographically, how far out do you reach? Uh, anywhere really in the country. Um, uh, the, I think the one project in DC, um, that was probably the first, the first to travel. Um, I learned while we were in Arizona, the, um, the personal relationships that you build by being in place really uh, mattered a lot. Um, so that means, has, and I didn't know this at the time, I was doing a lot of things that really didn't pay. They were gallery things, they were, um, you know, low, uh, low dollar amount projects, the, the storefront things. Um, and I didn't really know if they were worth my time. And I'm here to tell you, if, at this point I can tell you they were definitely worth my time uh, because the, the projects that I did with those administrators, um, uh, now, a couple of years later, I'm still applying to the, some of those same agencies and cities in the, in the area and those people have moved on to higher positions and they're now like directors of things and they notice my name and they say, oh, I work with him. He didn't completely disappoint us. He, you know, he followed through on what he said he was going to do, uh, and that goes a long way. So I'm finding, you know, I'm applying to things all over the country, but I'm finding that a lot of the things that I'm getting are in Arizona, based on those relationships. So I'm, you know, I, I have like three projects going on in the Phoenix area right now. I'm, I, you know, I 
I like the people I work down there with. I'm not particularly fond of Phoenix as a place, but um, that's kind of been my base for these public art things, and, and it's all based on those relationships. How do you calculate what you pay yourself when you write these proposals? 15% um, artist fee and 5% uh, project management fee. Um, so those are pretty standard. Um, some people will argue with you about whether you should have that 5% for project management, and I will say you absolutely should include that 5% for project management. I, I have projects where it's, most of my effort goes into project management. Um, you know, I'll be working based on cartoons that I've done, you know, found in my sketchbook from a couple of years ago and kind of culled them together and made a, a, a design that I'm proposing. And then, you know, for eight months, I'm refining that and calling people and administering the project. So, so you definitely want to, uh, I would say, make that a firm, a firm 20% that you ask for. And if you're looking for um, examples of budgets, um, this has been an exciting opportunity for me to show those actual proposals. Um, feel free to check out the, at the end of each one this budget. Um, and even if you want to take a photo of what those categories are, um, those can give you a you know a basis for for how to what kinds of percentages to, to devote to different categories, whether it's insurance or or your own fee. So you know, so twenty percent generally will go to me. Eighty percent is going into the other costs of it. Um, and and the other um, thing with budget is that if you are working early enough in a building, and with the terrazzo floor, that was the case. Some of the, um, if you're lucky and you can negotiate that, some of the construction cost can be yep. used for the artwork because the artwork is an integral part of the construction. You know, with your jelly bellies, it's probably a totally different story. Yep. But with terrazzo floors and, and some of the screens, sandblasted, divisions, uh, uh, how do you call those things, all the stair steps and things like that, quite often um, you can borrow some money from the construction budget. Yep, for sure. Like the the, uh, the furniture for that uh, streetcar stuff, right. that was, you know, we didn't have to pay anything for the, the cutting that design. Um, and that was really just that my, you know, my partner knew that trick. But it would have never occurred to me that we could you know, added all that artwork basically for free. Um, so, so even if you proposed this, so you would have had a grant or something for beautifying that area, or there was some kind of cultural grant, and then you proposed it, you got the grant, and then you got the property. So it, they're actually not grants that I'm dealing with. Okay. Um, generally, for, for applying for grants is kind of a whole other, it's a related, set of stuff but um and, and a lot of the skills of writing your artist statement and getting your ducks lined up and, and all those things kind of feed in from one to the other but i it, generally um for for uh artist grants you're looking at people at, you need to come up with the project completely from a on your own and propose it to an agency that's offering a grant um it, it's generally not integrated into um, a construction project in the same way. It's generally like for you to, you know, you have to decide what you're going to do, what you're going to make, where you're going to put it. it it's just a, a kind of a different animal. Um, so what's happening with, with me um, for the, the public art projects is I'm finding these listings um, and they tell you exactly what, what they're trying to commission, uh, where it's going to sit in the architecture. Is it a mural? Is it um, a stairway? Is it a, a freestanding sculpture? Um, and then they want you to send in, they'll tell you exactly what they want. And it's almost always the same thing. It's a certain number of, of images of your previous work, an artist statement, your resume, references. So getting that package of four things together um, it goes a really long way to, to going through these uh, to, to getting on your way to, to applying for public art. Um, so many of these challenges that you're, you're bringing up are absolutely there. Um, I would say, look, jump in. You know, you're not gonna have the answer to all of these things. You're gonna find them out on the way, you'll make mistakes, but um, 
I thought I thought your point of uh, uh, are these low budget things worth my time was really good because as the art center we've given those opportunities yep. and um, artists have gotten follow up things out of that you you gain experience also working in that type of scale absolutely yeah uh, because your your work you're sitting at a at a desk and you're making these little things and, how does that work out on the scale as you see there of that banner? Because that banner is only one of uh, 15 or something. Yeah. Uh, so those low budget things are, are, um, are really actually in a way a cheap learning school. For sure. Uh, in a way you get yeah. paid for education. Yeah, yeah. You know, even if you, you should look at it that right, way. Right, and even if you if you break even on those projects, you know, I mean, the amount that I paid for my for my formal school, and um, you know, I didn't learn any of these things that way. I learned them all from from this kind of opportunity. Um, uh, so, so yeah, they're really valuable, and I wish I had known that when I was doing them. I wouldn't have been beating my head against the wall so much about doing it and known that it actually was worthwhile, that, that building those relationships and showing things and getting things started and learning how to, um, how to manage a small budget teaches you how to learn, manage a larger budget. Uh, absolutely, doing those things makes a big difference, so I'm, I'm super grateful for those kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Well, and the point of you saying learning how to manage a budget is very important also because again, panels will look at this is the budget, this person has done uh, similar budgets in the past and was successful, so they feel more confident. If you make the jump from the $500 or $1,000 window display to a $3 million project, it's probably not going to happen and probably also too overwhelming to boot. Yep. So you work your way up in, in the... And it always sounds a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then you lop off 80% of that budget and it you know, shrinks really quickly. Is that, is that what it is? It, it's a budget that they give yes. you and yep. then you take 20% of that and try to fit everything else in. So, yep. But when you're dealing with construction, uh, don't you kind of cross lines into they have some construction plans and people that are doing certain things and I mean uh, the, yeah um, my guess is that the further I get into this world um, uh, the more it's my job is going to intersect with what the construction guys are doing. Um, you know, this terrazzo thing put me in much closer contact with the, the construction people than I had been before, because um, it's a larger budget than I've done. Um, so Sometimes for, the call is too late for right, that early right. integration. Yep. And then uh, it's just a matter of putting up something on the wall. Yep. And those would be the things that I would be looking at if I'm just starting starting out as things that, you know, they're calling for a mural. Um, like if you can you can learn the basic skills of, of how to how to paint a mural. You can partner up with someone who's painted murals before, um, and you can apply for things as a team. Um, almost all of these opportunities will say open to an artist or artist team. Like they really do encourage that, um, and there's a good reason. It's because if you know if you have a portfolio of paintings. Um, but you've never done a mural, um, maybe you, there's someone who knows how to paint murals, but they don't have imagery that suits this particular project in their portfolio. So that's a really good combination to my thinking to, to pair up um, because they wouldn't have enough have a chance of getting this, this commission and you wouldn't have it individually, but together you can kind of knit together the skills that they're gonna be looking for in that portfolio. You have to be okay with people walking on your work. Yeah. If you if you if you make a terrazzo floor, you have to be okay with that. Right, right. It's not going to be wholly uh, in a gold frame. And if you look, if you look at the things that I have done before, you know these you know carved crayons and polymer clay. These are like the most fragile, temporary, um, destroyable materials you could possibly look for in. in in art, um, so I, I when I started this journey out ten years ago, um, I had no 
concept of how I was possibly gonna get to work my way into some materials that that were permanent. Um, and it kind of just revealed itself to me over time. You know, I started going back to my sketchbooks and saying, okay, these are 2D things, they're linear, they're kind of cartoony. What could I do with this? How, how could I translate this into something larger, more permanent? Um, you start kind of seeing, seeing directions for yourself. Um, and, um, you know, again, having a community around you that you're reaching out to and, and sharing these, having these conversations with other people that have different experiences is, is huge. Um, there's another thing I wanted to make sure to emphasize is that, um, you know, if you're at a, a block point and you don't know what you're doing with your work exactly, um, a great way to make opportunities for yourself is to um, take on a project that makes opportunities for other artists. Um, it will get you into those working relationships with people. Uh, you know, you have an idea for a show. You happen to know a few artists that are under shown in the area, and you know someone who runs an art center, um, and you, you know, uh, pick up the phone and make a cold call and propose something. Um, and through that process, you meet the people at the art center. You meet the other artists. Um, you know, it's a it's a great way to. Um, to learn some promotional skills is putting them to work for other people's work. Um, it's always been a lot easier for me to, to just gush about someone else's work that I'm excited about than to do that about my own work. Um, it, and, you know, but you learn gradually to talk about your work through that experience and you build these relationships with other artists. They're grateful to you for creating an opportunity for, for you. It opens up a line of dialogue. Um, and, it, you know, I, a cynical way to, to describe that would be networking, um, but I think it's more kind of sincere than that. It's more of a question of, you know, opening up real, real conversations with people just by, by creating an opportunity that you can share with someone else. Um, so it's really a, a basis for, you know, a good start, a start of a good, solid uh, professional relationship um, if that's something that you're, you're in need of. I think also once you are selected for a particular project, um, it is now in the interest of uh, the people that have commissioned you that you're going to be successful mm -hmm. because it's going to it's going to reflect on them. How could you pick this artist? I mean, really. Um, so so they will want to support you. Yeah, you're absolutely not on your own once you, once you, um, when you jump into this world. And it's kind of like the, you know, the challenge of having a baby and raising a child. When you start out, nobody has any concept of how to do it, but you do it a step at a time. Um, you decide at some point you're going to take the take the leap um, without knowing what the next step is going to be. But it sort of tends to reveal itself if you if you jump in. That's that's kind of been my experience. Um, and you, you know, you don't ever have to figure out the entire end game all at once. You, you know, you're starting with smaller projects. You're working your way through them. You're getting guidance from the administrators. You're working really closely with the administrators, um, and that's a very different relationship than, say, with a commercial gallery, um, where they really don't have time to hold your hand and, and um, you know, work with you and figure out what you want to do and how to do it. And, and, and my experience with public art administrators has been amazing in, in how helpful they've been in helping me get to the next place. Have you had any bad experiences? Um, I just had an experience with, um, in DC, um, which was, it, it was really frustrating um, trying to get people to return phone calls. <laughs> and I experienced this um, with the administrators, I experienced it with the fabricators, with the people at the school, um, and I've never really had this level of, of this, this particular problem before. I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's the way DC functions, it's you know, the way I'm communicating, but um, people not returning emails and kind of, this was the first time I really felt like I was kind of left on my own to figure out a lot of things, and, and fortunately it worked out okay, um, but really difficult. Um, but again, if you're if 
you know, one of my concerns going into this was too many chefs stirring the pot, right? And, you know, I'm finding, I'm having a complete opposite experience where, you know, just like banging on the door trying to get some feedback into how, I, you know, how I should be doing this. And, you know, it's, it's kind of refreshing in a way to have that, that problem when you expected the other problem. Um, so that's, that may be the worst that I've run into. Um, and I, you know, I think it was a question of people being uh, overworked, having too many things on their plate. Um, uh, uh, also, you find out that because you're, you know, your project, you're working with a fabricator, it's kind of small potatoes to them. They're used to doing much larger things, so it's, while it's fun for them, it doesn't necessarily become their top priority. So you do have to get used to sometimes calling and calling again and remaining polite and not losing your temper. That might be the biggest challenge that I have in an ongoing way is to just not take it personally, just continue. If I don't hear from them, give it a day or two, right back. Um, you know, that's, that's a really important skill um, it, it, in public art is to not take it personally when your project is not everybody else's top priority. And you know, we, we worked through it. As, as the deadlines got nearer, I found that they got more responsive. Um, they were not, a, you know, I thought I'm, you know, I'm doing this all ahead of time, I'm months ahead of schedule, I'm asking questions. You know, they're not interested because the deadline isn't looming for them either. So they, they're dealing with their more immediate deadlines. And once the deadlines get closer, you start getting more attention. So that's another thing I've been learning through this process is um, uh, working, working well with a deadline coming up is probably maybe a better skill than being able to work way ahead of time because it's much more difficult to get everybody on board and helping you without the deadline looming because those other people may need the deadline pressing them before, before this becomes their priority. So that, that kind of patience is really really important to keep in mind. And I, I, did, I, did you ever have to make uh, maquettes um, for proposals? Um, mostly my things. Model? Yeah, um, well that's, I, that was one, uh, so those. So they're um, called? Uh, yeah, and those were um, uh, just polymer clay painted, painted bronze gold. Um, so low tech maquettes. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, um, I I don't work well with right angles. So anything that's going to require architectural models is just not not likely to be my thing. Yeah. Um, so the you know the maquettes that I end up having to do would be something that I can handle um, with the materials that I, that I understand. Um, but again, I, you know, I just met a guy who does is amazing architectural maquettes, and he's really into collaborating and looking for community art projects. And you know, so now he's in the back of my mind. If something comes along that's an architectural thing, I know someone who could do that. And you'll generally like when you're asked, you become a finalist. They give you a little bit of money to put together your proposal. Um, so it'll be maybe five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, you know ranges, but you've got a little bit of money to play with. So that can be your first experience of commissioning someone uh, to, to help you is, is putting together those proposals. Um, yeah, my experience is that um, if, if that is a requirement for when you're select, you're in the second round, the better the maquette, the better the model, yep. the more chance you have. Yep. Tape together things are not going to cut it. Yep. Where do you learn about, um, you know, calls to work? Like, what are your places that you look at? Um, call to artist, uh, sorry, callforentry.com. Um, definitely write that one down. That's a big one. Um, if you're at all interested, that's probably the first place to go. Call, call for entry. You know, I always get this wrong because it just comes up automatically. It's callforentry.com, callforentry.org. If you put in call for entry, but one of those, you'll, you'll get there. Um, and publicartist.com, or org, or at least 
these things that I just have in my... Let me see if I can get this, because I shouldn't give you bad information. Um, uh, RACC, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, um, that's the, um, the Portland uh, Public Art or, or Artists Organization, and they deal with a lot of things all over Oregon. They have listings in, you know, in Washington as well. Um, another one is Artist Trust, uh, artisttrust.org. That's um, the Washington-based um, Arts Commission. They have opportunities. Um, okay, so RACC, Artist Trust, callforentry.org, publicartist.org or com. Um, what else? So uh, if you start looking, um, I, I, I've kind of built up a, like a bunch of bookmarks of individual agencies that are run like so many cities will have their own agency and they'll put out their calls. And um, so if you start Googling call for entry, call, public art call, um, and then just chasing it down, just spending some time um, following those links, and they'll lead you to other other listings and other agencies, and just kind of build up your bookmarks that way. So now I've got my list of bookmarks, and I just kind of run through them. Um, it's a really good way to procrastinate actually making things. Yeah. Um, is um, doing these um, these kind of administrative things, like just digging through for opportunities. Like I, I find myself doing it, you know, if I'm just in the supermarket or whatever, or you know, if I'm home and I'm, I'm just not feeling it creatively. At least I can do something that's that's um, productive and finding these opportunities. That's kind of fun. That's kind of a treasure hunt. Um, so just digging through these listings. Um, and I, you know, for the most part, I throw things out left and right. It's a, it's a much smaller proportion of, of things that I actually apply for. I'm really selective about it because when you start looking, you'll find there's a ton of things out there. Um, and uh, call for entry is also a good place to look for exhibition opportunities. Um, but one important uh, distinction to make about uh, about the exhibition opportunities you'll find there, they'll almost all have a fee. Um, because, um, as we know, like a lot of art centers um, will um, have, have large uh, jury shows and they have a significant um, fee involved and they make a budget that supports their other opportunities. I mean, the art center actually is extraordinary in the number of low-cost opportunities that you guys put out. Um, uh, some places are much more cynical about it um, and they're, you know, these, so the ex exhibitions will have like a fee of $35 to enter. Um, Sometimes that, per image. Per image, yeah, and it gets gotten ridiculous. Um, but the, the, when you're applying for public art opportunities, there's never a fee um, because they really are trying to attract, a, you know, a wide range of artists and it's a totally different, um, different goal that they have in mind. Um, so those are all free, and all of these, these websites, um, you, you will, um, like for call for entry, you will open a free account, you'll upload, you can upload up to 100 images, you'll kind of build that over time, um, and you'll, they'll, you know, a certain opportunity will ask for 10 images, so you'll select out of your images which ones to, are appropriate for this opportunity, um, you'll upload your resume, I'm constantly revising my resume and my statement, um, like almost for every, almost for every opportunity. Um, uh, and keeping, update your website. What's that? Update your website. I, I'm not nearly as good at that. <laughs> um, and, and that's actually been a surprise to me is how little the website has come into play compared to the uh, the entries. Um, yeah, I've been able to get away with having my website not in... Uh, well, if you shape. have uh, uh, 50 people submitting and a committee, mm -hmm. they don't have the opportunity to look at 50 websites. Yep. So that's probably it. If it is a much smaller kind of thing, your website is important. Yep, yep. So definitely yeah, a good idea to have a good website. But, yeah. Yep. And what you mentioned about uh, agencies, 
For instance, the city of Seattle has an absolutely stunning uh, public art program. And finding cities like that would be a good idea. Um, and if you're willing to travel, um, that can be a good way um, to, to open yourself up to other, other things. Um, what I found, luckily, being in Arizona, was that there's a, a surprisingly large number of opportunities down there, um, and there's not nearly the number of artists that there are, say, as, as up here in the Northwest, um, because Phoenix is just not the draw that Portland or Seattle are. Um, so they're always looking to, to broaden their, their group of people. Um, if you're willing to travel a little bit, you know, these opportunities are open all over the place and it's not nearly as competitive in that area as it is up here. Um, and they also will pay a lot more for, the, um, for these kind of entry level projects. Um, like those, the storefront ones that I did down there I think we're like $4,000 budgets. So something like that, if you're not spending a lot on your materials, you could afford to take a trip down and, and go do something like that. So uh, another place to look, the city of Phoenix um, will have listings on their website. So sign up for all those email lists. Uh, all the cities around there, Scottsdale, Tempe, um, you know, the last place in the world that you would expect to go to for art opportunities, but because it's a limited, um, artist community down there, there's, there's work to be had. So what else have I not covered? I'm sure lots of things that I've gotten to. Um, and in terms of uh, photography, whether, whether you thought about public art for yourself or not, um, there, there are a lot of ways that photography gets translated into public art. There are things like people, um, uh, printing in enamel, so doing kind of enamel tiles, you, you see some of those things. Um, um, you know, really permanent ways of printing photography in, in half toning. Um, and there's, um, again, it's a field that a lot of photographers don't really think about. Um, so there, there are opportunities out there to, to have your things manufactured, you know, for the outdoors. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.